Hello LinkedIn and welcome to another LinkedIn live session. I'm Sarah from Tribal and today I am so thrilled. I always love conversations with Danielle. It's not your first rodeo this one Danielle is it? So <laughs> But great to have you back. So Daniel Guzman, Head of Social Media for Marshall McLennan, and also came to our event in May and so many amazing insights that we're going to go through today. So thank you for joining us on the chat. This is a great opportunity. If you're not listening to the podcast, you should join live because you get to ask our guests live. So pop them in the comments, give us a wave, say hi. I see Tim's here, Dave's here as well. Thank you so much. As we go through, I always have questions for Danielle. We're going to be talking about how to embed social into your business, into your whole advocacy program, into your business. And uh, I know Danielle's got some amazing insights. So for those who don't know who you are, Danielle, do you want to just give us a quick intro to who you are, what you do, where you're living, that kind of, well, not obviously, not detail. <laughs> Absolutely. Sarah, well, first of all, thank you so much. It's great to see you again. It was fantastic to be a part of the event back in May in London. It's probably my favorite event from a real opportunity to meet practitioners, to, to learn and come away with some real actionable insights. And I certainly look forward to being inspired every time I'm there. And we take so much away from it. So thank you to you and the tribal team for that. Um, so you already introduced who I am. So I am actually based in New York City actually based in Brooklyn, but I, I work in New York City. Um, and I work with Marsh McLennan and I lead their social media, which is super exciting. And for us, the social media COE is a makeup of all the components that come under social media. So your traditional owned media through to paid, through to influencer marketing and then employee advocacy, which I think is what we're gonna be chatting about today. Um, and I find that really exciting because I think it's the integration of everything together that allows us to really be impactful and connected as an organization. Yeah, and that is the key thing. So when we did this event in uh, May, we talk a lot about connecting the dots and the fact that it's all sitting under you because it does impact each other. It's not in isolation. So anybody who's leading a, a part of this program, maybe you're leading the social selling part, maybe you're leading a, a executive activation, maybe you're leading influencer marketing, for you, it's under the same roof, Danielle. So can you give me a bit of insight into how it integrates into your business strategy? Do you sit above all functions? Do you integrate into functions? You know, give us a bit of a insight into how it integrates into the business strategy. Yeah, it's a great question. So it's definitely not above. I'd like to see everything as a true partnership and collaboration and everyone brings their area of expertise to that kind of, I guess, communal table. Um, and we have a team that works kind of across all of the businesses. And then we have colleagues that are within the businesses that have expertise as well. So whilst there is kind of a core group for social media, we also focus really a lot on empowering our other colleagues, whether they're marketing, whether they're communications, whether in the business who have passions for social media, because the more we can empower and equip our colleagues in these different functional areas with the know-how and the tools to be successful, they can then carry that forward as well. So um, I'm a big fan of kind of centralized and decentralized at the same time, if that makes yeah. sense. And then in terms of with business, um, it's a great question. I think what's most important, and whether it's with Marsh McLennan or with other companies that I've worked with, where I find the real opportunity and when things really work well is when you're a part of the conversation from the beginning. Maybe not the moment something is conceptualized, but very early on so that as they're putting together the plans, as they're thinking through the options and opportunities, we're able to have a voice in there because sometimes there might be an idea that changes the direction of a part of that program and or maybe allows it to become bigger than it otherwise might have been. And I've also worked on the flip side before where we basically are a distribution network because for many people, they see social media as a distribution network, similar to email marketing or any of our other distribution channels in the marketing universe. That becomes limiting in my opinion, because at that point you can only take what you've received and move it out the door. It may not be appropriate for the channel. It may not be optimized. It may not even really, deserve to be on that channel. It's not the right thing to put on that channel. And then there might be a significant amount of missed opportunities like this conversation we're having right now at LinkedIn Live or another type of live activation, which can't be done kind of at that very last moment. So to me, what I would say is take that opportunity to build those connections early on, 
become a part of that broader conversation and then be a part of that entire journey. Yeah, you see what I'm hearing there is almost like you've got to build a bit of an internal brand, like the, the you know, the moment somebody thinks, hold on a minute, I wonder what the social element is a part, part of this program that we're doing, this campaign that we're putting together. And then you almost want them to think of you first. You're almost doing a bit of a, a social selling role internally. So you position yourself not as a channel, but as a as a part of the strategy from the get go. So we've already uh, got questions. So and that's great. Um, how large is the social media team? That was my question. I was going to ask that next. But yeah, go yeah, on, no, it's a great question. So there's, <laughs> there's there's 12 of us in the in the core COE. Um, okay. So kind of across all, right. all the different assets of social media. Um, and that includes everything from building the content that we put out on company pages, like the social assets and the messaging to running all our live events, to all the operations and enablement, meaning everything from brand rotation management, community management, social listening, crisis management, customer care. Um, and then also includes paid media advocacy. So it's actually, and sometimes I think that seems big, but in talking to a lot of my peers in other large multinational organizations, mm -hmm. it's actually not big. Um, but then there's also kind of smaller teams within some of the big businesses that we have under the kind of enterprise umbrella. And then where the magic to me really happens is what I was talking about prior is working with those broader marketing and communications professionals who may not be, you know, officially in a capacity on the social media team, but they absolutely are integral and have um, roles that they play to enable activation in local markets because uh, it, it in my experience, and I, I would welcome the um, experiences from community members as well, it's hard to truly be effective in Thailand, for example, sitting in New York City. You really need that partnership with the colleagues who understand the markets intimately and have that expertise and can bring it together. So we kind of set the stage, we we provide the, you know, the structure, the knowledge, the best practices, and then work with them um, to help them be successful. And sometimes that has a heavier hand meaning we might do a lot of the build in partnership with them. Sometimes it's more passing on the how to and the ability to do that. And then they do it and we are more in a consulting role. So it's really kind of up to each individual how we best work together. And I think that agility is what enables us to work so well as a kind of broad collaborative global team. Yeah, I always remember actually somebody saying, um, you know, you have to sort of embed yourself. You have to weave into where those communities are hanging out and be part of their team meetings. And, you know, so it really feels like you're almost threading through the organization at that in that way. You know, you're not sitting up here in an ivory tower sort of dictating and ruling the roost and doing everything. You're actually equipping and enabling and empowering. I think some of the words that you used about building that culture, the digital culture internally. So. I love the use. Of, I, I love your use of word threading. I think that's such a appropriate visual. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of what we do as like well sewing. is kind of yeah. A lot of times yeah. the, it's just even checking in. How's it yeah. going? What can we help with? Where are you finding yeah. pain points? Where can we open up opportunities? Um, and that in itself then inspires them to continue elevating and advancing. Because as we know, whatever is happening today on our platforms is going to change tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, you've all, you've got a very service mentality. Actually, I love the the way that you see your function as an enabler for the business. You know, you see it as an accelerator for the business, an enabler. Um, but yeah, that comes. Well, I, I as well. find it's interesting. I, I maybe throughout my career, I, I've worn so many different hats. I've all, I, I remember this was dates me back, but when I first joined my a prior organization, AIG, um, a CEO who interviewed me at the time had said to me that your goal in any role you ever have should be to equip and empower those around you so well that you can leave and they can do your job because only then can you find the white space to be innovating, opening into new areas and pushing those boundaries. If you remain at the core so that you are a requirement in order for it to be successful, you'll never have that time and opportunity to go to what's next. And it's kind of scary. It's like standing on the edge of a cliff, knowing that I could leave tomorrow and they can do it. 
But at the same time, you're kind of thinking, what next? How do we do it better? How do we do it differently? What's changing and how do we respond to that proactively instead of reactively? So it's a really exciting kind of place to teeter in, which I really enjoy. Yeah, it's a leadership mindset. Love that. Danielle, I've got to, right, somebody's asked a question, then I'm going to lead it. I'm going to hold on to that because there's something you said about experts and influencers that you did at our event. So um, so somebody said here, um, oh, yeah, being global with a local presence. Love it. So much more impactful. Uh, and then somebody's asked, how do you connect with those people who aren't directly associated with the social media team? So it's a, maybe it's a great question. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel this is where and, and there was a question that I received earlier this month, which I think I put in a post to this event, um, which is I feel to be successful, my opinion, in a social media role, you really have to be focused on relationships. So, so it, it's really a relationship role more than anything. And I really value connecting with colleagues proactively, reactively, understanding where they're at, knowing that there is not a direct line of report everywhere. But if you build that trust and you build that mutual respect and you build that understanding of what and how we can all help one another, I do find that it almost builds community in and in of itself. And so I really value that. I spend time every day trying to connect. Actually, I just did this last week. I don't know if anyone else does this on the platform, but I like to send video direct messages. And so I went through our company pages to see what colleagues were sharing content or engaging with our content. And I picked 10 people. I didn't know any of them from across the globe. And I went to my direct messages and just sent them a video message and said, thank you. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for being active. Thank you for advocating for the enterprise. Um, and it's an honor to be a part of your network. That's it. No ask. And if you do that, you start building those relationships. Imagine if you're doing that every week or every month over time. Um, yeah. it, 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 it's like a rolling thunder and it works incredibly well. Um, yeah. so that's one of my little tricks. And I do that as well with uh, obviously just community members as well. I just did it two weeks ago, which is fun. I, I yeah. encourage everyone to try it. I mean, take 30 to 45 seconds, just push that little video button on your phone. Say hi to community members who have shown up in your stream. It's the little moments that mean such a, that create such a huge impact. And 10 people a month, that's achievable, right, Danielle? Yeah. You know, if you're in that role, it's achievable. I'm going to ask you something and then I'm going to come, we've got some more questions and comments coming up. But I want to ask you about experts and influencers because and it ties into how you measure impact, all right? So I'm going to maybe cover a couple of those at the same time. But at our event, you showed something. I can't remember the stats off the top of my head. I was going to have a look before we jumped on. But I had microphone problems, hence the reason we're starting late. But, um, but you showed something about the impact of your top group of ambassadors compared to the rest of your whole employee advocacy tool, compared to your brand channel audience. So... Can you just explain a little bit about that and how you demonstrate impact? Because I think that's quite, quite impressive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, I think if you can't demonstrate that is driving an impact, it's really tough to be able to continue in a program and or scale it. Um, I, what I like to always look at is something that we can all have access to is just the organic or owned media that all of our company pages have. If we look at any platform, X, LinkedIn, pick your platform, for the most part, the ability to reach individuals organically has continued to decrease. Um, and I've seen data points across the spectrum. One of the most recent ones I saw on LinkedIn is we're now down to about a 2% kind of owned media organic reach in, in individuals' feeds. And this was at 9% not that long ago. So it's very difficult without a paid strategy and not everyone has budgets for a paid strategy. But we have people people who have chosen to work with us who are passionate for what we stand for as an organization. And so when we look at just a general employee population, we drive about 70% more click throughs through just advocacy activity versus just owned organic activity on its own. Um, and I think, you know, I've worked with several other kind of large companies just kind of supporting them. And it's just something I enjoy doing. And you can tend to see about that 50 to 70, 80% kind of sweet spot because all of us are going to get more engagement with our networks than a company page will with the odd exception. Um, once we though integrate just a focus on those experts or internal influencers, these are people who uh, either have a deep expertise in a subject matter or an industry area. And obviously their community is really focused. What we're seeing is it's actually double that. So that click through rate is like 140% plus. And if you think about it, it's a small percentage of your population. 
But if you're able to carve out for each of your core, either businesses or maybe you have functional areas or maybe you have products and service areas, and you can carve out those three to five individuals who are active or want to be active and are talking about that specific niche topic, they're going to drive just an outsized engagement. And we see that more than the channel will and more than our broader population will. So it's kind of important if you can to bucket it and it's tough. Right. We don't have any special secret ingredients. We're all working with the same LinkedIn API. Um, so it is tough. So the good news is um, you tend to work with smaller groups. The less good news is there is a little bit of manual work because, yeah. you know, you and I can't be looking behind the scenes and all this data. Um, so even with advocacy platforms, which we do have one, it still does have a bit of a firewall between an individual's personal data for, for the right reasons and what we can see. So there is a bit of a partnership there, um, but it's a reciprocated um, kind of two-way relationship because we learn and then we help back, like how to keep building that momentum. But I definitely yeah. like to look at um, click-through rate. I like to look at shares as well, um, just because from an executive perspective, it's simple, but it really does show a story. There's only so many times you can share content on a company page. Yeah. But if you imagine that company page and let's say it posts two times a day, three times a day, five times a day, and then you've got a handful of employees, even if you have 10 employees, and each of those employees posts a couple times a week, or even once or twice a week, you can see how that scales pretty quickly. So we do like to share just how much that topic has been shared on the company page versus our employees. So you can kind of see just that perspective. And then we also just look at clicks as well. Um, and this becomes really interesting, particularly when you start looking at something like talent acquisition, right? When you can track the number of clicks on a job opportunity through our employee population versus a company page. And then what I like to do is kind of, I call these kind of leading KPIs or social KPIs, whatever we wanna call them. Um, then we look at the business side of those KPIs, which is if it's if it's a job, we're looking at, did someone click on it? Did someone you know consume the content, et cetera? Then from a business perspective, we're looking at, did they complete the application? And then yeah. did they get hired? And, and that follow through is, is not easy for every part of the business. Um, but being able to do it just one place, find that one place that you can isolate and do it. And then you can start to figure out how to do the next ones, but at least you can show that value because if it exists in one place, you can replicate it. Yeah. And you, and you have to start from that. There's a few things actually that were going on in my head as you were talking, which is the data can also drive where you focus your advocacy program. Because if you see, I mean, I've spoken to a couple of customers that maybe have a, a talent shortage in a certain region or around a certain area. It's like, well, let's have a look at the employees that are already active in that region or subject matter expertise or whatever and let's activate and accelerate them because they're more likely to be connected to the people that fit your culture that might want to come and work for you and you know and this, you can reverse engineer from data as well which i think is fascinating um oh what was i going to say so much there so much right i'm going to come to the comments and the and the questions so vicky hello vicky great to Hi, see you vicky. here oh Vicky came to our event as well and talked about the psychology and neuroscience behind advocacy, loved it. I hear so many leaders say they struggle to find the time for strategy because they are so in the doing, but that's managing, not leading in my book. Honestly, guys, it, there's a book there, absolutely brilliant book. And I know anybody who's met me, spoken to me, will hear me bleating on about this book. It's a really good book for any leaders that are wanting to do more leading and less doing. Um, so that's a good yeah, one. Yeah, and, and maybe you, if I, can I can I add one little comment to Vicky because I think yeah. she I think she highlights a point which is really important to the conversation, which is there's a big difference between just building your presence on social media, just being active, having a profile that's doing content, putting comments out there, and building a brand, a professional brand, like for an individual. Yeah. And I think you need to look at those too, um, especially when we're working with colleagues, because some people just want to have that presence and that's okay. But it's, it's, are you able to build that connection, that emotional connection with your audience? Are you able to build that resonance and that relevance with a specific audience and, and know that when people are talking about you, when you're not there, that it is fully aligned with who you are, your values, and and what it is you bring to the community. And that brand is is I think where it requires more of what Vicky's talking about, which is the strategy. And that's longer tail. That sustains. Whereas we do have a lot of colleagues and individuals on that we see every day that 
just have a presence and there's nothing wrong with either, but they're very different. And I think it's acknowledging that when we think of influencers and experts, we really want the brand investment. Whereas the broader colleague population, it, it really comes down to the individual and why they're showing up and then making sure that we support them on the journey they want to go on. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point, actually, Danielle, because it's about the maturity level, isn't it? And really being quite defined about it's OK to have a presence. That's fine. But as soon as you want to start building a brand and a professional brand, you need to really be clear about what you stand for, who you are, what that means for you, who your community is. There is a bit of work around that, which yeah. is being consistently uh, you have to be consistent with your brand, who you are in person and who you are online. So I think that's a great point. I remember now the bit that I wanted to ask you and then I'll ask this question. Um, and we and anybody who wants to, we are going to talk about Taylor Swift. All right. So uh, anybody who wants to log out later, <laughs> we, <laughs> we are bringing Taylor to this LinkedIn live, but for good reason. Um, one thing you did mention at the event, and Wendy talked a bit about this around paid thought leadership ads. So those experts and influencers that you have identified and you are accelerating, then you mentioned tying your paid, you're connecting the dots between paid and advocacy and giving paid thought leadership and accelerating their brand and building their presence within their community. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I thought that was a great example of connecting the dots. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I'm a huge fan. So when we think about, we've got these individuals, they're already prolific. They're doing this because they want to, and we're partnering with them to collaborate with campaigns and other activations. As I mentioned earlier, we obviously work across paid as well. So if we're going to be amplifying and applying a paid strategy to a company page strategy, and that component involves SMEs, Historically, or maybe traditionally, we would take the corporate route and then we would be featuring on the content would be the lead. So now what about leading with our people? And that's kind of the, the thought there because the thought leadership ads, when they first came out and we started testing them, we quickly realized that if you have an individual that has already built their brand and now you're giving them that visibility and that momentum to break out of their network and into degrees on the platform that they otherwise wouldn't get into, and they have that built-in habit that they're going to be engaging with the direct messages that come in and the activity that goes with that content. It's really quite a strategic marry. It's almost like working with external influencers in some ways in, from a dynamics perspective, but they're not. They're, they're, it's investment in your own people. So they are rewarded by seeing their followers grow, by seeing their network build up. Um, these are things that they they're passionate about and then they're relevant audiences because it's paid so that thoughts to leadership ad works in many ways similar to targeted paid so they're getting those relevant audiences coming to them um and i just think it's a great way to kind of recognize reward and at the same time continue to give back and build the business in a, in a really effective way so i wouldn't say it's get rid of your traditional paid but i think it's yeah. really valuable to look at who your spokespeople are who are those individuals that are channeling those community, those messages that you want to see elevated. And this is just a way to kind of, it's like rocket fuel to help yeah. them move faster in the right direction. But yeah, and I love that. And it's reciprocal, it's good for the business, and it's good for their, their own individual community and brand presence, it's brilliant. Um, there are a few people here, Tim, that's offensive. He said he's leaving uh, at the moment <laughs> I mentioned. <laughs> and he said, hold the door. <laughs> yeah, who was <is> that? <laughs> Oh, we're coming back to that in a minute. Um, I am going to ask this question here. How do you make sure that the impact of what you and your team is doing, including advocacy, gets the visibility and recognition within the senior Marshall McLennan uh, senior leadership team? Great I think question. It's, so, it's, it's a great question, and it is so important. Um, you know, they all, one says what gets measured gets done, but then you absolutely have to elevate um, and we do work in collaboration through a couple ways. So obviously one with our internal stakeholders, be them marketing, communications or other stakeholders um, to be a part of those kind of roll up post event summaries to talk about, you know, we've all been a part of a, a, a cross functional team where there is PR recognition of the media hits you've received or there is, you know, the web traffic, etc. So we make sure that we have a really strong set of KPIs that we can report on um, to talk about the contributions to building reach, 
building engagement, driving towards those business KPIs that were predefined. So that's one way of looking at it. I also really like to also just show the, the presence overall, because when you think about it, social today continues to become a bigger part of the overall marketing conversation um, and to be able to just demonstrate how the channels are performing um, from an engagement perspective, the types of conversations, and then those anecdotal conversations are critical. So when we talk about experts and influencers, what did they, what conversations did they spark out of their direct messages? Um, maybe they got a client meeting or a prospect meeting. Perhaps they got an opportunity to be featured in Harvard Business Review or another really relevant publication. So we like to capture all of those because those count as a part of demonstrating how opportunities come forward because a lot of people don't realize that. And if you just go across and talk to your employees, just walk the floor and ask them, what has happened to you via social media? You'll find out, oh, well, I met someone that I've been trying to connect with for years and now we've connected or I just got this introduction or I found my next new hire. So there's all these little moments that we seem to just think, oh, yeah, that's nice. But when you roll those up, that becomes a pretty powerful statement. So um, and I like to share that on a regular real time basis as big events are happening. Uh, make sure we never miss a moment to show the outcome of that event and the impact. And then also in a more kind of calculated way. So on a quarterly basis or a biannual basis, but also appreciate the fact that there is something to be said about too much. So we do try and make sure that um, we have kind of quarterly, uh, biannual, um, and then campaigns are more in the moment though. So I would say put yourself a little pyramid together of what you're going to do on a longer tail basis versus what you're going to do in the moment, but you want to always be present. I think that's the important part. But I, that goes for yeah. any function, right? Out of sight, out of mind. So I would say that for, for any kind of role that I'd want to always have a presence to show the impact. Yeah, it's the qualitative and the quantitative. It reminded me, actually, I spoke to a CMO last week and they said, um, they were saying, I'm getting more visibility. I'm getting invited to events. I'm getting invited to be, be on a panel with a with. This is what I was looking for, which is to raise our visibility as a team. Um, and then a sales director. He said, "I'm getting people reaching out to me, asking for meetings." And it's the inbound. It's the it's those little moments that you don't get in a tick box on a CRM, or you don't get in a logged request or a data point. Or it's the you've got. You're absolutely right. I like the moments. And though. you just have to ask. Because people won't come yeah. forward. But if you ask, yeah. like go and just take a look and find five to 10 people who are active, passionate, and work for your organization and ask them what's happened in 2024 as a result of what you've been doing. And they love to share. And yeah. then all of a sudden, you've got yourself a really phenomenal story of all these incredible moments that have come all because of they're using social media effectively. Being active. Kind of tied all together. It's amazing. Um, <clears throat> might miss that one because I want to talk about AI because Danielle you were telling us some stuff at the event about how you're integrating AI and I've clocked the other question so we'll ask that as well so uh before we talk about AI is, a, AI is an exciting spot in an exciting space um yeah tell us about what you're doing at Marshmallow Lennon on AI and how you're integrating into advocacy programs and you know yeah I mean I think it's it's an exciting and interesting space in the sense that should we use it? Should you not use it? How much is too much? Where do you draw the line? Um, and I, I, I've been looking at this a couple different ways. So for one, um, and I saw one of the questions that popped up about types of content. And so it kind of connects a little bit into that question as well, in the sense that I'm guilty of this as well. Um, I can't tell you how many LinkedIn lives I've been on but it almost always feels like the first one when you do another one. I don't know why. Um, and that feeling often exists with a lot of individuals when they go to post. I had a great session this morning, a couple hours ago with a team, a team and one of the biggest obstacles that was shared was, I just never know what to say. Um, yet we all have the most incredible conversations all day long, whether they're in the office or out of the office, where there is something that was communicated that someone else would benefit from. Maybe it was how you're managing your calendar, or maybe it's how you navigated a difficult situation. Um, the list goes on. But everyone on this platform is here to learn, and LinkedIn wants content that is going to help others achieve what they're trying to do or overcome obstacles or better themselves. And so one of the things that I, we've kind of looked at and I, I've played with a lot on my own is how to use AI to just take ideas and turn them into kind of 
content starters. So I'm I'm not a fan, and I personally, so I, I, you know, this is where it becomes kind of a personal choice, but I personally don't like to use it to write content. I enjoy kind of coming up with ideas, but it's not to say you can't say, what are 10 different ways of looking at X? And then it kind of might spark some blind spots that you never thought of, or it might give you an idea to run with. So one of the things um, I like to do is create prompts to kind of help people come up with content ideas. Um, another way as well is our, is our profiles on LinkedIn. One of the things I always like to do, whether it's a colleague or not, if I'm connecting with someone on LinkedIn and I happen to see that like they don't have an about section or they're, they're missing a headline, um, I'll offer them and say, hey, you know, you, you have an incredible story to tell. You should have a headline that really elevates this. Um, it's just kind of in my nature to do that. But you can create prompts that will help someone build a headline. And, it, and then when you put in who you are, what your area of focus is, et cetera, um, it'll just kick back however many headlines you asked for. The idea isn't to use that headline exactly in that same exact way, but it should inspire some thinking to then tweak it, or maybe you're gonna take bits and pieces from all of them and come up with your headline. Because the hardest thing I consistently hear is starting from a blank sheet of paper is really tough. So same thing, um, kind of creating prompts for your about section so that you can just give it the information that you need and it will give you back an about section. Um, I like to even take other people's about sections that I find really inspiring and give it to, to AI as examples. I don't want it to look like that, but these are examples of what I like. Now, here's who I am. Now, give me back something. And then it becomes the canvas from which you start kind of to tweak from. Uh, and that's been incredibly helpful because it is really hard, especially if you're a fast paced uh, executive moving um, and you, you, you're working on your own and you're like, I, I don't know what to write. Can you write it for me? Well, like, no, but, but AI can actually help get you started. And that's actually allowed us to move a lot um, faster. Um, so profile optimization to me is, is a great one. And then just coming up with content ideas and different ways to package that content. You could say, here's what I'm talking about. And can you give me how this would look in a carousel? Can you turn it into a poll for me? Um, so come up with different formats and then from there edit them so that you can then use them. I, yeah. The one thing that I will say where it gets tricky, and I, I'm sure if we've got some marketing AI experts in the, in the community is AI is, has gotten, there are ways to tell if someone's used AI. I don't know how else to describe it. There are certain words, ways that sentences are structured, et cetera. And I think, um, Sarah, we had a great session um, at the event where we focused on that. We kind of had a bit of a guessing game to try and figure oh, out yeah. which one was written by yeah, AI, which one wasn't. And yeah. um, not everyone has that skill. So this is also why I'm always very cautious to say just really make sure you bring yourself to whatever you're using AI to create because otherwise it's not you. And the whole reason you're showing up on social is to build those trusts, relation, trusted relationships. But then if the conversations aren't actually your voice and your thoughts and the way you would articulate them, are we really building that trust? So use it as a catalyst, but not as the outcome. Yeah, as an editing tool, as an assistant, as a structuring tool, that's always quite good. How would you structure a post with something like this or titles, right? So create, here's my blog, Here, I've written this, give me five options for a title. So use it as a more editing tool. Right, gosh, look at the time already, Danielle. Right, where up? what type of content are people making and how do they come up with ideas to post? So I think we kind of covered that a little we bit. Kinda, we yeah, we kind of covered that. But I mean, I, we can kind of say one real quick thing on that. Um, and I kind of, I went through LinkedIn's um, creator program, I believe it was oh, called. Oh yeah, I did that. Um, so I did that yeah. last year. And one of the things I found most valuable um, that came from this program was the types of content that really resonate with community members. And that's something that I certainly share forward as well. And one of the big categories is the idea of sharing leadership and management and career advice. So what are those milestones, the relationship opportunities that have been key to your career trajectory or something that you'd like someone more junior than you to know as they navigate their career? Tactics to improve your productivity or ways to have a build a more productive workforce. Like we all have these experiences within us. It's a matter of just putting them down and, and creating a post out of them. Another one is those industry trends and regulations, right? So what's changed that your customers must know about? Or what are your peers and customers always asking for your perspective on? Or what do you need to know in order to make a good business decision 
in the functional area that you're a part of or the industry that you're a part of. Uh, maybe there's tech that you're keeping an eye on with the hot next innovation. So all that kind of trend and regulatory environment. And then there's my favorite, which is the behind the scenes, right? We all want to be a part of something that we're not a part of. So if you're speaking on a paddle, if you're doing it offsite, you're hosting an event, you're doing a team gathering, people love to see it. Use those multi-image posts, talk about what came out of it, maybe a couple headlines, what you've learned that others can benefit from. Um, and, and that works really well. And then the last one is just kind of company news. We all want to celebrate people, new hires, you know, big launches, updates, press releases, acquisitions, whatever those are celebrating people that were involved in that, celebrating the value that's coming from that. Um, so those are kind of the four big buckets of content frameworks that I took away from the creator program, which I've definitely carried forward. And then just whatever you're thinking of writing, how can you fall into one of those buckets? And the other tip that I got, which I thought was really valuable is it's hard to write a post sometimes. Not everyone is, you know, in handling and can just be so prolific with their words. Certainly not me, but I'll record myself. If you're walking down the street, ever walk down the street, you're going to the grocery store, you're in line, you're at the airport, and you're just thinking in your mind, and all of a sudden you start talking in your mind and you have this genius idea that happens, hit record on your phone and capture that moment because it then becomes the beginning of a post. Um, I do that all the time, so I have all kinds of voice notes and then I just turn them into content. I was just maybe I'm just crazy though. and no one else but me does this. No, I was going to say voice notes. I went for a walk. I, I, I go for quite regular walks and then suddenly things come to your mind. Walking is brilliant for inspiration. And then suddenly just hit the voice note on your phone, you know, and start recording some of those and capturing them. Actually, what I haven't figured out is how you transcribe those and then put it into ChatGPT to summarize the key phrases, the points, the language. Um, that, if anybody's got a tool, please share, because I, that would be very helpful, how I can get my voice notes into into AI. But there was a, there's a couple of things I've noticed, actually, which is noticing, because you mentioned about, um, you know, creating content ideas and encouraging employees. I think a lot of this is the noticing, is noticing when you're in that moment, noticing those leadership experiences that you've had, noticing, hmm, I'm at an event, I could perhaps turn this into something. And it's instilling that habit, that behavior of noticing actually i think is is what what employees perhaps can't get over and have you got any tips for that or anything that you share with employees well i mean i think we're our own worst enemy when it comes to that because think about it i mean we all unintentionally subconsciously compare ourselves to someone else we come onto a social platform we're like oof i, I can never be like that but you don't need to be like that. You just need to be you. And whether you've got 10 followers or a thousand or a hundred thousand, those people chose to be a part of your community because they want to hear from you. They want to engage with you. So I always feel like if we can bring ourselves to kind of that realization and then know that you just had three or four meetings, did you share any advice? Was there anything you did with those meetings? Maybe you had an agenda. Not everybody uses agendas, that I can guarantee. So what's okay. your agenda strategy in order to make sure that you use that time effectively for you and for the people that you're working with? Share that. And I guarantee you, a lot of people are going to be, thank you. Like, I've never thought about using an agenda strategy. I don't even have an agenda strategy, but this will be a much more effective use of my time. So if we just kind of stop um, and pause, like we're always running from one thing to the next. So I actually like to build 15 minute breaks into my day. And during those 15 minutes, I kind of think, okay, here's what I got done. Did I get done what I was planning on getting done? Um, any key takeaways, any kind of aha moments, any ideas that I want to just whiteboard to be able to come back to at another time. And that's kind of a great moment to also then look at those little 15 minute captures and see what from that can I translate into something? Because yeah. I think otherwise we just keep going. We never stop. Mm -hmm. Back to back. And we must be coming up to your next 15 minute break actually, Danielle. So we probably... <laughs> Quarter, it's quarter two. Oh, right. I'm just going to cover a couple of things here. So, Marlin, Marlin, thank you for joining us. I know. I also, love the oh, I love the comment she made. Oh, I like the idea of letting AI inspire your work, not do the work for you. Humans are always more interesting than machines. That is why advocacy works so well. Absolutely, Marlin. And I love, I love the that. second one. The most effective way of robbing oneself of confidence is comparing yourself to others, oh. and we all do it. Yeah. 
yeah it's a, yeah do you know we should do a session on this i wonder if i should bring a few people on this actually so not to do with social and advocacy but actually on leadership techniques so yeah, yeah. love that yeah we should do that marlin we should bring you in right um now uh, here's another one sonia thanks for the tip just pop a note into chat gpt and it will transcribe is that right, Sonia? So I had no idea. Notes. I'm going to try this right, right after the oh, Straight after. Oh, you let every day's a school day. Right now, before you go, I have to. I'm bringing Taylor in. So if you want to leave now, you can. But I suggest <laughs> you don't because <laughs> maybe so you have Daniel to hear the backstory. Me. Daniel's a Swifty. I'm, I am. My a daughter's a Swifty. And now I'm a Swifty because Daniel convinced me to go and watch Taylor Swift at the concert. And it was fantastic all right so i wasn't really into taylor swift but it was by far one of the best nights i've ever had it's been amazing um and daniel i know you've been to see taylor swift not once but twice um but you said just before we came on it was a bit of a cliffhanger and then we had to go live there's a lot of parallels between advocacy and taylor swift and you're working on a post around this, but can you give us a sneak peek, please, Danielle? Talk to yes, me. Yes, and I, I think, I mean, this in itself could be quite the fascinating conversation because when we think about employee advocacy, we're trying to engage, inspire, connect with, and essentially enable or move people to take action. That's essentially what we're trying to do, but in a meaningful way, in a way that they want to, and in a way that's aligned with the goals of your organization. Well. I hate to say it, but she's doing that if we think about it, right? Um, for those of you who are interested, send me a DM and I can send you the link afterwards. But I've watched, I think, about 80 of the live streams, parts of them, not all of them, because I'm, I, I have to do it after work hours. But she live streams every single concert. So if you've never seen one and you want to see one, I can send you the live stream um, link and you can watch them live stream. But think about it. She's observing. She's listening. She's on all the social media platforms looking at what are people saying about her and sell, how are they celebrating her? How are they not celebrating her? And then she's incorporating that into everything from her lyrics to her shows to her costumes. So what a wonderful way of kind of showing that I'm listening and I'm acting and you're all kind of influencing that. I mean, if we could take a bit of that and be like, how do we listen to our employees better? How do we observe them more? How do we then show that we're listening through our actions, be that the video message that we send through direct message, be that saying thank you on a company page for their contributions, et cetera, be that commenting into their threads. There's so many ways that we can take these little moments and turn them into ways to build that same type of connected community that she's built within an enterprise. If we can do that and do that successfully, that's incredibly powerful. Not easy. No, and it isn't. And she does engage. And that the key part there is the listening. You know, we always say to employees, when you're starting out on social, listen first, listen to your community, listen to your network. And then you'll understand the conversations to be part of, but she does it brilliantly. And, and anyone who's been to one of her concerts will know it's not a concert. It's an experience. It's a, you are part of something quite incredible. Um, you know, the bracelet swapping, the t-shirt wearing, the, you know what I mean? It's you're part of a movement. And I think you've used moments, movements, and, and it's much bigger. Sorry, I don't want this to go into a Taylor Fest, but you know, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. I've got that T-shirt. So, <laughs> so right. I'm going to stop now because we're going to put everybody off. But um, Danielle, thank you so much for this. Uh, it is always a pleasure. I love talking to you, and I do feel there's a bit of a, a sideline thing that we should get Marlin and you and talking about. Oh, leadership I think that would be. And... It's one of the biggest obstacles. I mean, <sighs> hon honestly, like being able to celebrate who we are and that knowing that everyone is good enough. And it's just a matter of how do we enable people to go forward, small steps at a time. But, yeah. um, and, and it's probably one of the things I hear the most in meetings where you might be training a large group and afterwards someone will say thank you because they joined as maybe the assistant or they joined as someone that was in more in an administrative capacity. And I'm like, well, everyone is equal on social media. There are no hierarchies. Right. It's all about being who you are and bringing that value. Um, but it's hard when you work in an organization and there are roles, responsibilities and hierarchies to all of a sudden think that 
someone or anyone could be your most influential employee. And I think that's exciting. Yeah, it's incredibly it exciting that, it, that it's really up to anyone. Um, and that's something that we have to help channel and, and encourage people to do. Yeah, fantastic. Always insightful, Daya. And thank you for everyone who joined. Oh, somebody's asking about my T-shirt. Danielle, I will tell you where to get the T-shirt from. It's brilliant. There's loads. Um, yeah, so it's on Etsy. But anyway, thank you everyone who joined us live and asking all these amazing questions and contributing as well to the conversation. I always love these sessions. And Danielle, thank you for taking the time. Um, and for anyone who's listening on the podcast, you can come watch the live if you want to have a look and, and connect with Danielle on, on LinkedIn. Do that because she's brilliant. So well connected and gives back to the community every week consistently. So um, so we're back on in two weeks. We're talking about advocacy and business results because we're talking a lot more about operational models and embedding it, threading it into your organization. So join us again in a couple of weeks. But thank you, Danielle. Really appreciate it as always. Um, TTFN, whoever said put that. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thank Take you care, so much, guys. Sarah. And thank you, everyone. And I will join you all in the comments. All right. Bye.